This is my mother. In better times. Her name is Ruth, Ruth Rodriguez. Um, Several years ago, that was probably about four years ago, five years ago, after my father had passed away, she was living alone, um, not alone, but living in my sister's uh, home. Um, She eventually moved into an assisted living facility outside of Philadelphia. This morning at 1 a.m., she passed away. And she went home to be with Jesus. In uh, 2019, dementia began to take over her life. Illnesses, falls, broken hip, hospitalizations, and an awful lot of deep anxiety and a significant amount of anguish in her own life as she struggled with understanding what was happening to her. And with my sister and I, we're a very small family. During one of my visits with her, I think it was in the summer, we talked about one of her most prized possessions. A picture that was hanging over her bed. This picture had taken on mystical qualities. It had become her dream. It was her longing. I'm going to show you the image in a minute, but I'll tell you it was taken by Barry, my son, your future senior pastor, um, in 2014 when he was working with uh, World Next Door. He was a photojournalist for a number of years. And he took this photo one morning. When you see it, it looks like a painting, but it's an actual, real photo he took. Actually, just about two months ago, he too had the opportunity. He flew out to Philadelphia and spent some time with his grandma. And they had a chance to talk about this picture. The photo you're going to see is of a gate, a garden gate. But in my mother's mind, it became a gate into glory. She would tell me, she told us, Barry and me many times, that she clung to this image imagining walking through it into the presence of God. And just a few hours ago, she did just that. I'll leave the image up for a few moments for you to take it in. For my mom, This image has been a source of peace as she knew she was facing imminent death. My question is, what does it do for you? And more generally, not so much the image, but what does this topic do for you? Side note, three months ago, we planned this sermon series, and three months ago, I insisted on preaching the sermon on death and heaven. Little did I know that the day that I would preach this sermon was the day my mother would go on to glory. I don't think it's a coincidence. And I do believe that because of this, something significant is going to happen in somebody's life here. Uh, I fully expect it. And mom, this (laughs) mother... might have been what you were waiting for. Some people portray death in poetic and romantic ways. Walt Whitman said, nothing can happen more beautiful than death. Very poetic. Emily Dickinson said, dying is a wild night and a new road. But then... There are others, wait a minute, I gotta do this properly. Rick, maybe you can turn me off for a second. (laughs) Guys, the production team has been very gracious. Take care of me, right? 
So some people portray death in very poetic, romantic ways, and others have painted death with more realism. This is what Anna Quinlan said in her book, One True Thing. She, she was talking about a person, she said, but her smile was bleak, without light or warmth. And for the first time, I thought of what must be like to know that you're going to die, that the trees would bud, flower, leaf, dry, and die, and you would not be there to see any of it. So how do you feel about death? In a beautiful, fascinating, and terrible way, we, all of us at Grace, have been deeply privileged to consider how we feel about death um, through processing the journey that Chuck Gross is going through with pancreatic cancer. You saw him, if you've seen the video of the, um, the care center, Chuck received the volunteer of the year and you could see that it was a very emotional time for him as it was for all of us. It was powerful. Um, I want to encourage you to go to um, his blog. It's chuckgrossblog.wordpress.com. There it is, chuckgrossblog.wordpress.com. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read to you a section from his blog. It was a strange moment as we sat there absorbing the truth of what we already knew. From one perspective, it was good and that there was no more wondering or speculating about what was going on inside my body. Suddenly, I had been reclassified from a 76-year-old man who had a short list of daily meds that included an 81 milligram aspirin and maybe two Tums to a pancreatic cancer patient. Another strange thing about this moment was that my lifespan had suddenly been defined. Like it or not, all of the numbers indicate I have four months to 24 months of life. Up to this point, my assumptions were that like my dad and birth mother, I would journey along into my mid-80s and possibly beyond. My oh my, how things can and do change. Please read more of his and Vivian's reflections on what he calls his farewell tour. It is stirring, it is sobering, but ultimately encouraging, encouraging. So thank you, Chuck. I'm pretty sure you're watching. Um, thank you for allowing us in on your poignant and personal journey, and I hope you and Vivian are enjoying the sun in Florida, and we look forward to receiving you back, I think, in March. So be safe, we love you. All right, so what does this all do for you? Obviously, this is laden with a significant amount of emotion, right? This is not a casual subject. It really is, and I'm not, there's no guarantee I'm not gonna dissolve into tears again at some point. Um, does it raise fear in you? Anxiety? Confusion, peace, comfort. Well, I have a word for you today, not just one word, but a word, you know, like something I want you to take home. Actually, it's not even my word, it's Jesus' word, so that actually makes it about infinity more powerful than anything I would say. So here it is. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Can we look more carefully at this? Would you grab a Bible and turn to John chapter 14, verse 1? That's page 896 in our house Bibles. All three of our campuses, you'll have a Bible. If you don't have uh, a Bible near you, raise your hand and somebody will get you one. If you're watching at home, please find a Bible. I think it'd be much better if you follow along. And also, you, if you don't have a Bible on your lap, you're not going to know if I'm making this stuff up or not. All right. So here's where we are in this series so far. This is going to be one, this is going to be one of these one of those um, power pack. Oh, I'm out. I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> but I get it. I, I know. I mean, it's, <laughs> Rick's got the trigger finger up there, ready. To, <laughs> he's going to blow. <laughs> 
So this series is like a, uh, a, a mini power pack series. This is four weeks long, but my, you know, I mean, already Barry helped us process the deep, anxi- deep anxiety that some of us are feeling and, and where peace comes from. And Amy, last week, we, she took us to the place that some of us happen to be of isolation and loneliness. Um, and this week, of course, the big one, the big fear the anxiety of death, and um, next week, I'll be back next week, uh, Lord willing, we'll see, I'm not sure when the funeral is going to be, I don't even know when the funeral is set, I'm waiting to hear from my sister, but hopefully I'll be back next week, and talk about the anxiety of not knowing why you're here, so we're going to talk next week about uh, why are you alive? Uh, and was, I'm telling you, when we're done, people are gonna, I know people are going to say, oh my gosh, that's serious in January. Because we all struggle. Barry said last, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he gave us these two images. This is the way life feels um, to us a lot, right? This is what life feels like. What we wish life felt like was this. So I'm hoping that through the words of Jesus, that we are going to feel a level of serenity. But let's go back to John 14, 1, and what I want to point out in John 14, 1, uh, don't let your uh, hearts be troubled, trust in God and trust also in me. That word troubled is the same word that Barry pointed out in chapter 14, verse 27, that he, he preached on. That word troubled means to be agitated like a sea, like water being agitated. Now, we gotta back up, as we always should when we're studying the scripture, it's always good to step back and take a look at the context and say, all right, what on earth was, where did this come from? Out of the blue, Jesus said, does he just say, let, don't let your hearts be troubled, trust in God, trust also in me? No, this wasn't out of the blue. Something was happening, and if you go back to cha- chapter 13, verse 33, you can see what had happened. Can you do that, chapter 13, verse 33? Because here's what happened. Jesus busts out this little piece of encouragement. I'll be with you only a little longer longer and where I'm going you cannot come well these are to some people men and women who have been following him for a couple of years and they're they stake their whole life on him and now he says oh by the way I'll be gone soon and you can't come with me do you think that they were troubled well yeah I think they were troubled go down to verse 36 Peter says this where are you going reasonable question And Jesus says, you can't follow now, but you will follow later. Look, they had no idea what he was talking about. At this point, they had no idea he was going to die. We know that because we know the rest of the story. So this kind of makes sense to us. Didn't make sense at all to them. They had no idea he was referring to the eternal state. No idea he was talking about heaven at all. They didn't know what he was talking about. The problem for us is not do we not understand what Jesus was talking about, but on this cold day in January of 2020, what troubles us is when will that day come for me? That time when I pass, I die. What will it be like? I'm gonna tell you what, I spent a good, good amount of time this morning just trying to ponder the question, what did my mother just experience, right? That's something, I don't know if I want to think about that or not thinking about that. It just, it it is, it is, yeah. Will I be welcomed into heaven? Do you wonder that question? Is my life, if ever wonder the question, is my life worthy of heaven? Or maybe you don't even think about yourself. Maybe your passing is so far in the future, but what your mind goes to is like my mind has gone to your loved one or friends who are nearing the end but there's a certain amount of agitation. Death ultimately is not poetic or romantic. I can tell you, if you would have seen my mother's body in the last two months, there was no poetry. It was not romantic. It was not, and even though she died, as far as, we, as, far as I can tell, even though she died somewhat serene, even in the last few days, there was pain and there was agitation. Death is a roiling storm of anxiety. 
But into that anxiety, again, are these words of Jesus, don't let your hearts be troubled, trust in God, trust also in me. So relief comes through this word trust. Now, this is the word um, pistuo, the Greek word, and sometimes it's translated trust, sometimes it's translated faith, and sometimes it's translated belief, all depending on the context. It means to be persuaded and have confidence in, to be persuaded to have confidence in. Now, here's the heads up. I'm gonna tell you right now, in just a few moments, I'm gonna ask you whether you possess this kind of trust in Jesus, and if you do not possess the kind of trust I'm gonna talk about in Jesus, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to put your trust in Jesus. So heads up, file it away, I'm gonna come back to that in a few moments. Let's dive further. Verse two. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Verse two, there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? It's a rhetorical question. Of course not. If it, was, if it wasn't true, I wouldn't have told you there was a place for you. There is a place for you. My father's home, this phrase, father's home, he's not just talking about a building. It's an, the implication is of a family. It's not a house he's referring to is a home. And I have in my father's family, there is a place for you. A place, the word place is a clearly a portion. It's not a separate house. It's not, a, uh, uh, it's not another home on the compound. This word means apartment within the bigger complex. My father, family, has a bunch of apartments in it and one of them has your name on it. And I am going to prepare that place for you. Now, interesting when he says um, to prepare a place for you, many times in, in the, the Gospels, when Jesus says you, many, many, many times it's corporate, like all y'all. I'm going to prepare something for Every, for all of you. That's not what this word is here. I have this, I don't know this for sure, but I have this feeling that when he said, I go to prepare a place for you, he was looking directly in somebody's eye for you and you and you and you. This was intensely personal. I go to prepare a place for you. Look at verse three, let's go on. And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you always be with me where I am. When everything is ready, when the time is right and the conditions have been fulfilled, I will come get you. I have for months been praying that my mother's, that, that Jesus would come get my mother, that the time was right. And even when I sat with her, when I went to visit her for the last time three or four weeks ago and I looked at her life, I prayed, Jesus, why not now? Why not now? because it was so miserable. I don't understand, only in the divine mind can we understand the timing of what Jesus said, when the time is right, I will come get you. What is the time, when's the time right gonna, when's it gonna be for me? When is, it, when is the time gonna be right for you? Does that thought cross your mind? When the time is right, I will come and get you and you will always be with me, the personal, Nature of this is stunningly beautiful and wonderfully relational. I will come get you and we'll be together. Together. And all this is so beautiful and wonderful till he drops, verse, look at verse four, till he drops this. And you know the way to where I'm going. No, they don't. Was he being provocative? Did he actually think his fathers would say, <laughs> we get it, you're taking us to the Father, right, oh yeah, heaven, this is awesome. Look at verse five. No, we don't. No, we don't, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Good question, Thomas. Many of us have the same question. How do we know the way? So Jesus dives in and brings clarity. Now hang with me. I'm going to cover a bunch of verses all at one fell swoop. Here we go. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. 
If you had really known me, you would know who my father is. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father, and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. So why are you asking me to show you? Show him to you. Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. All right, so while there's a lot going on in this section. So I'm gonna try to pick out of this and summarize the big idea that Jesus is trying to communicate here about this business, about there's a time coming when the time is right, I'll come and get you and I'll take you to be with me in my father's house, you'll be in the father's family and there's a place for you, this whole thing. But now he's explaining the way that that, to get there. And his big idea summer is, uh, centers around three words. Did you see them? I tried to emphasize them as I was reading it. I I gave a little more emphasis. The first word is no. That's a key phrase here or word here. The second word is see. And the third word is believe. Now, I want to point out how those three words are tied together and how crucial they are. Let me tell you something. How you hear what I'm about to say in the next 10 minutes may inform your eternity. I don't know how I could say it anymore. Importantly uh, than that. So three words are crucial. He, Jesus is like, look, do you know me? You should know me. By now you should know me. And if you knew me, then you would know the Father. The word know here, uh, it's important. It's a Greek word, gnosko. Uh, it does not mean no, as in I studied and now I know. It has nothing to do with, well, I shouldn't say nothing. It only has partially to do with um, intellectual belief, the things you've learned, but it mostly has to do with what you've experienced, to know through experience, all right? There are people in this world, um, let me pick somebody I, I would, uh, who's a, Fam- it doesn't matter who it is, a famous person that I would know by looking at on, on the news or reading about them is very different than me knowing many of you here, because I know many of you through experience. I've sat down and maybe had coffee with you, or I've sh- shaken your hand, I know a little bit about your family. I know you through experience, not just intellectually. That's what Jesus is saying here is, look, do you know me by experience or don't you? You've walked with me for the last three years. Do you know who I am? And then he says, and if you know who I am and you've experienced me, do you see? Do you see? Have you seen the Father in me? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, this word see is an interesting word. It doesn't just mean look physically and see somebody. It means to perceive something. There's a way we would say it today. uh, To use our vernacular, Jesus would say, not do you see me, but do you get me? Do you get me? Do you get who I am? Because if you get who I am, then you will get who the Father is, and you'll get what I'm talking about, all this business about the Father's house. What he's saying is if you know me by experience, and you should by now, and you see me to the point where you get what I'm talking about, then you'll be able, we get to the third word, and that is believe. And it's that same word from the very beginning, from 14.1, that there is is translated trust, here is translated believe, and sometimes it's translated faith. Trust in God, trust also in me. I think he's implying this. If you know me, and you see me, you will believe in me, and you will entrust yourself to me. I'm going to take a stab at summarizing Jesus' words this way. If you see me and know me, you will entrust yourself to me. 
and when you entrust yourself to me, you'll be at peace, for your future will be in my hands. That last phrase is important. If you entrust yourself to me, you will be at peace, for your future will be in my hands. My mother entrusted herself to Jesus. She experienced Jesus in her life. She understood him. She believed in him. And I believe she walked, I I think Jesus, I don't know, do I know this? I don't know this, but I sure hope and I pray that she actually walked through a gate just like that picture. Not only in the arms of Jesus, but there she saw my dad. Interestingly, Chuck and I were talking last week before they left for Florida. Somebody had called him. Somebody had lost a daughter. When you think about this, this is stunning. Somebody had lost their daughter this past year and they said, Chuck, you're gonna see her before I do. And would you greet her for me? And then it hit me and I said, Chuck, you're gonna see my mother soon. You'll be the next one to see her when she passes. Would you greet her for me? My mother believed. I think my mother will probably, Penny, I think my mother's gonna have soup and sandwiches on for Chuck (laughs) because that's what my mother did. So here's the, here, let me wrap this up. Um, Do you get Jesus? Do you see him for who he is? If not, you have some work to do. Listen to me. You cannot form an understanding of Jesus simply on the opinions of others. You getting me now? You cannot believe in Jesus because your mom told you to or your Sunday school teacher told you to. Doesn't work. Sorry. Neither can you reject Jesus based on somebody else's jaundiced viewpoint. You have to be intellectually honest and study his life. Don't you dare think that you can dismiss Jesus just because you're not down, you haven't read it, not paid attention to it, it's just not part of my life. You had better give yourself intellectually and you better study his life because your entire eternity kind of depends on it. Do you see him? Second question, do you know Jesus? Again, this word, remi- rem- let me remind you, it means to know by experience. Have you experienced him? Entrusting your life to Jesus cannot by any means be simply an intellectual experience. You have to interact with him. Have you prayed? Have you considered his presence in your life that he has been with you? And if you can honestly say to me, I get it, and I've experienced his presence in my life, I would would guess that right now as I'm talking, some of you are experiencing his presence in your life right now. You would not put words to it to right now, but now you're going, I get that. So listen to me. If you see him and you get him for who he is and you know him because you've experienced in his life, the time has come for you to entrust your life to him. This is the ultimate question of all ultimate questions. Have you or will you entrust yourself to Jesus? Listen again to his his words. If you see me and you know me, this is my summary, you will entrust yourself to me, and when you entrust yourself to me, will you, you will be at peace, for your future will be in my hands. Those are Jesus, I think that's Jesus' words to you right now. Can you surrender your doubts? Can you surrender your fears? Can you surrender your skepticism? Can you surrender your cynicism? Can you surrender your future to him? Can you surrender your present? It's an interesting week this past week because last Saturday, a week ago right now, a number of us were in Chicago having attended Marin's mother's memorial service. It was powerful. As you can only imagine, as Marin and her sisters 
sang, and it was absolutely stunningly beautiful. And at the end of the memorial service, they sang a song that many of you know, and I actually, when I was growing up, uh, I didn't like this song because I was so sick of it. Because we sang it again and again and again and again and again and again, and I was like, oh, please, can we go home? But as I sat there in that service and I heard them sing it, I knew I needed to sing it to you. Just a couple of verses. And I'm hoping that the words will bring you to the place of surrender. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. So can I explain that to you? Lamb of God is the phrase that describes Jesus, the Lamb who was sacrificed. The songwriter Charlotte Elliott wrote this song in 1835, and um, without one plea means I, I come to Jesus, I, I have no defense, I cannot make my life good enough, I have no plea, so my only plea, the only thing I can cry out for is that your blood um, was shed for me, I'm a mess, I can't make it myself, I can't make myself acceptable to you, and Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross is the means by which we can entrust ourselves to him. Just as I am without one plea. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, Fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Let's pray. I don't want to belabor this. Um, but I do want to give you the opportunity. To surrender your life to Jesus. And I'm not even gonna tell you how to do it. You just tell him what you want to say. He has an apartment for you in the family of God in heaven maybe next door to my mom's and my dad's or mine. But you only get there and he only comes and gets you when you've surrendered your life to him. So surrender your life to him right now and accept the peace that passes all understanding and the guarantee of future in heaven. So do that right now. I'm gonna stop talking. I wanna give you a chance to tell him what you wanna tell him. Oh, thank you, Jesus for your great love for us and for doing the unthinkable to prepare a place for us. For everyone who is within my earshot at one of our campuses or online, and they realize that they have never really and surrendered their life to Christ, it's only been intellectual, or maybe they've been holding out. Receive them now as they've surrendered their life to you. And Holy Spirit, fill them, I know you will. And give them the peace 
and the serenity of knowing that they are forever in your care. And when the day comes, when their time has come, and they depart this planet, because they've surrendered to you, you will receive them, and they'll be with you. Thank you for those who have surrendered. And thank you for this time through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. You'll also find service times and locations for all three of our Grace Church campuses. We would love for you to join us. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.